What we're going to do today is to talk about uh, the application of uh, uh, imaging in forensic science, in forensic anthropology and in forensic medicine. Uh, we are going to touch into, uh, we're going to go into three main aspects. There are more things that we can do with imaging, but we don't have uh, enough time. And I will go very briefly on each one of these uh, um, applications. And of course, if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat and Sebastian will uh, uh, put us in touch. Um, what we're going to deal with is uh, the use of imaging for age estimation of the living clinical forensic anthropology. We're going to deal with the cause of death uh, and with necroidentification, in which I'm going to put most of the emphasis. When we're talking about the uh, age estimation of the living, we are talking about mostly about the uh, undocumented minors. This can happen either because uh, we're having huge uh, waves of immigration, of migration between countries and uh, people come undocumented either because they don't want to have the documents or because they lose them on the way. And it also goes with political asylum. It's almost, almost the same idea. When we're talking about uh, criminal accountability, of course, when we're dealing with a person that has a problem uh, with the law and the uh, justice system has to decide if this person is a minor and has to be treated uh, uh, accordingly or uh, if he has reached the age of uh, um, accountability and will have to be uh, to get the full force of the law. Uh, a minor problem that we have here in Israel is the ad adjudication of pensions, where people that have come into the country uh, from different uh, areas of the world where the, either the uh, date of birth was written in a different way or was not written in the documents of the documents have been lost and they have been living in the country with a assigned date of birth but when they come uh, the uh, the time to uh, get their pension they ask okay the date i have uh, on my document is wrong i'm actually already 67 years old i i want my pension and we try to deal with these problems it's not easy it's very difficult to determine age after uh, growth and development uh, is finished. And a little bit, we have uh, the same problem with the people that came uh, with uh, uh, bad documents or uh, the uh, government made a mistake and they, they, uh, they're asked to enroll into the military and the child is only 16, and uh, but the government is uh, requiring them to enlist. So we have, we have to deal with these kind of uh, questions. Uh, as I said, I will speak very briefly about uh, the, how the age estimation is uh, performed using images. There are various uh, um, guidelines proposed by different organizations. The one that we use here in Israel are the guidelines proposed by the International Interdisciplinary Study Group of Forensic Age Diagnostics, ACFAD, which is uh, uh, based in Germany, but most European countries use it. And uh, they have uh, um, not only a set of guidelines that we can use, but they also uh, send you an exam every, every year and uh, uh, they uh, qualify you if you, if you have uh, given uh, the correct answers for the three or four cases they send you and you, you are qualified for another year to provide um, age estimations for uh, the legal uh, environment. Um, so these are, are the guidelines that mostly we use. Uh, yesterday I was asked who is uh, in charge of providing the um, final report on age estimation here in Israel is the forensic pathologist, but usually the pathologists ask the help of a forensic anthropologist because uh, somehow we are more versed in the uh, intricacies of um, age, uh, uh, age estimation, maturation, and uh, the effects of the environment and things like that. So what we use is mostly radiographs of the, uh, the teeth. We use uh, um, different uh, atlases to compare the calcification of the dental buds. Uh, I, you have here a few examples. Here you have an example of uh, the calcification of the um, 
uh, dental uh, uh, deciduous de uh, dentition. Uh, you have here uh, uh, deciduous and permanent teeth, and we can compare the, uh, uh, the radiograph with uh, atlases that have been provided by different uh, authors. Uh, here in Israel, we use mostly the Al Katani uh, atlas because it is uh, very updated. People keep sending them radiographs and they keep updating it all the time. But uh, most uh, um, atlases are very good for uh, edge estimation. And the important thing to remember is that the dental calcification is considered uh, the most. Uh, a reliable one as far as uh, it's not affected by environmental factors and it's very uh, little affected by uh, ethnic variation. We know the different variations and we know how to take them into consideration when we're doing the estimation. Another uh, dental method that it's uh, utilized instead of utilizing a, um, an atlas, we use the Dermigian method, which is uh, a uh, comparing each one of the uh, seven uh, um, permanent uh, teeth of the mandible. We don't look at the third molar and we uh, give a score to each one of these uh, uh, permanent teeth. If it's uh, developing, if it's completely developed, then we put together all, all these scores and we uh, compare it into a chart separate for males and females and we give an age estimation. We can use the third molar in a similar method. Uh, it's been proposed by a number of authors. One of them is Schwartz, is the one I use for estimating age over uh, 17, 18, et cetera, uh, up until uh, 26 years of age. The um, ACFAD the, um, guidelines suggest not to use only one method, but to use a combination of a few methods to make it into a, a, a more comprehensive age estimation. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the ossification of the hand. Uh, it's, uh, it can be again used, uh, done by uh, an atlas method. We use a uh, uh, Lulich and Pyle method for uh, age estimation in which we compare the whole radiograph with a series of radiographs taken at different ages. This method is a little bit old. Uh, it is, has been suggested by most uh, uh, investigators that it is better to use the TW method, Tanner and Whitehouse, from um, either the two or the three, depends uh, uh, which one you have, that they are not very different. In this uh, Tanner and Whitehouse, me uh, Whitehouse method, what we use is the uh, development of each one of the uh, carpal bones, the bones in the uh, radius and ulna, and uh, the um, ep distal uh, epiphysis of the uh, phalange of the third phalange of each one of the fingers, and again we give a score to each one depending if it's a boy or a girl, and we do as a um, we, still, we put together all these uh, scores and we check it in a graph and give an estimation of the age, of course, with uh, a, a standard variation of two years for uh, either side. Once we have reached the um, final development of the, of the hand, or it's, it's much more difficult to give an age estimation for older individuals. Uh, so we uh, look at the ossification in the other parts of the body. The most common one used is the uh, clavicle. Uh, we, we check the ossification of the external end of the clavicle and we have different phases. We can look at uh, in which phase it is, uh, the, the bone uh, is at the moment of the radiograph or uh, image was taken and we compare it with tables and give an age estimation, which is good to up to almost 30 years, plus minus 40 years, something like that. Uh, over 26 is uh, rather difficult to decide which uh, age we're talking about. Um, the problem with this is that it's quite difficult to look, uh, to, to discern the ossification stage from a radiograph. You can see here, 
the external end is still open and we can see a uh, um, black line that's between the diaphysis and the epiphysis. While in this case, when it's completely closed, we cannot see this line. It's not very easy to see it on radiographs and it's much better to, uh, to see it on CT. You can see it here very clearly, the, the, the line of cartilage that separates the diaphysis from the epiphysis. The problem with this, of course, is that it's a gray, it's a, it's a huge amount of radiation. And here in Israel, for instance, it's not permitted to use uh, uh, radiation if it's not for a um, medical purpose. So when we're dealing with the uh, age estimation, we have to get uh, the consent of the individual to have the, the exam. And if it's a minor, to some uh, adult that is accompanying this uh, minor or a judge has to issue the order. But when you have to compare the amount of radiation you give with an, a radiograph and the amount of radiation you give with a, a CT, of course, the judge or the adult or whoever is accompanying this minor will say, no, let's go for the radiograph. I'm terribly sorry that uh, it's more difficult for you. So that's a, um, a problem with age estimation using the clavicle. Uh, another method, we can look at the um, ossification in um, many parts of the body. We can look at them in the knee and in the oscoxa, and there, very, uh, there is a great number of radiographs that will give us more than one bone to permit us to discern uh, at which uh, stages of, of ossification these sets of bones is, uh, is and to uh, establish a uh, to estimate the age. One of the methods that was proposed in um, uh, around the year 2000 by uh, Bachelti, and it's uh, very much used here in Israel, mostly in orthodontia, but I have been trying to, put, to forward it also for age estimation of the living in uh, forensic cases, is the maturation of the cervical vertebra. There is a very good correlation between the maturation of the, cervi of the cervical uh, um, vertebra and of the mandible and of the teeth uh, themselves. Uh, it's very easy to visualize in a cephalogram, which is taken anyway when you're doing a, an orthodontic study. And there's only six phases of development and what they do, uh, each one is correlated with an age, uh, something uh, between uh, uh, 12 and uh, full, mat full maturation, which is uh, 16, 17. Oops, sorry, I will go back. Okay, what you see here is the cephalogram in which you can see the teeth, so you can do the age estimation of the dentition. And at the same time, you can see the, the vertebrae and you can do a trace of them and uh, examine the shape of each one of the vertebral bodies and uh, give uh, an age estimation. So it's very commonly used here in Israel. Uh, less uh, common uh, in other countries in Europe. Now, if we are talking about identification, I'm moving now to the thanatological aspect of uh, imaging. And um, before I start with the uh, identification itself, I like to show you more or less what happens here in Israel, although it is from 2015, but uh, except for a slight difference during the COVID uh, years um, where less, uh, it was less common to, uh, to bring experts from outside into the Institute of Forensic Medicine. More or less, this is the distribution of identification. As you can see, there is something like 20% of the total cases that uh, uh, arrive at the Institute of Forensic Medicine that require some kind of a positive identification, of scientific identification, which can be the DNA, radiography, fingerprints, uh, uh, special characteristics. And you can see almost of the cadavers are identified by uh, uh, next of kin. From this 20%, we have done, uh, um, we have tried to separate uh, with uh, the frequency of each one of the uh, methods which, is, uh, uh, which are used for identification. 
Of course, the fingerprints take the largest uh, uh, amount of uh, identifications. It's easy, it's fast. You, if you have the antemortem uh, data, it's very easy and uh, very convenient to do. When we don't have fingerprints, you can see that uh, uh, um, a radiographic identification takes a very large chunk of this identification, almost 20% of the cases. Um, I read in some of the most uh, recent literature that some uh, 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 practitioners report up to 60% of the identifications performed by radiography. This, of course, depends on the av availability of the radiographs. Uh, for a very long period of time in Israel, um, patients are given the, the radiographs, um, take it home, or the disc, the CT, take it home. The hospitals don't have space to keep it uh, in the in their computers. So as uh, uh, some hospitals are not keeping the data, it's sometimes difficult to find the antemortem data to do the the comparison. And my favorite uh, uh, way of imaging, of course, is the virtopsy. Virtopsy started some twenty years ago. It was uh, very slow to get into forensic medicine. It's not cheap. You have to buy uh, uh, the CT and you have to uh, build the walls to protect uh, the rest of the uh, institute. And uh, it's not a cheap issue, but it is a very, very elegant way of doing imaging. It has many advantages. This is the CT of the Institute of Forensic Medicine in Israel. It's a regular CT. The Gantt has to be a little bit larger than, you know, when you are choosing the type of CT you're going to buy, you have to remember that some of the bodies that are going to go in there are uh, uh, bloated from decomposition. So you have to make sure that the Gantt is large enough to, to put in the larger bodies, but it's almost the same as uh, doing a regular CT. We do a full body examination of all the cadavers as they uh, arrive into the Institute of Forensic Medicine. It takes about 10 minutes to do the full screening and then to take the body out. It, it, it's a very short procedure, so almost uh, uh, in 15 minutes you will have the complete uh, CT. And it's uh, very convenient because you can look at it from uh, the side, from the coronal aspect, from the sagittal aspect. You can, as you see, you see the body with uh, uh, complete as it arrived into the institute. You can look at the soft tissue. You can look at the skeleton. Uh, you can uh, turn it around and you can do cuts on uh, whatever you're looking for and get a uh, closer uh, examination. So it's an excellent tool, highly recommended. It's not that I sell uh, CTs, but I really recommend it. The first thing we're going to talk about imaging in uh, forensic anthropology is the uh, estimation of the anthropological profile. Like uh, uh, when you are looking at the bones themselves, you can do it from images and uh, for the anthropologists among us, it can save a lot of time in cleaning and um, dealing with decomposed material. Uh, we can uh, do sex estimation, of course, the torus, uh, you can see the torus orbital, uh, supraorbital, you can be, see the mastoids, you can see the insertions of the muscles. And uh, here is just a radiograph, but if you have the whole uh, tack, you can uh, turn it around and look at uh, uh, the whole CT. Sorry, and you can look at everything uh, very closely. Uh, here you have an example. Uh, if you're looking at the pelvis, you can see the subpubic angle. Um, you can turn it around. You can see the ala of the oscoxa, of the ilium. You can look at the femora if you just want to measure the diameter, uh, the um, diameter of the head of the femur. You simply you can cut eliminate the parts that are uh, obscuring uh, your view. You can take the measurement on the with the CT and uh, you can get uh, not only visual examination, but also uh, measurements as well. When we're looking at ancestry, the same, the same way you can look at it in radiographs or in the CT, you can uh, uh, distinguish uh, if you, you can position the, the head 
uh, at the proper um, Frankfurt plane, and you can examine, for instance, uh, the shape of the orbitals, and you can make measurements if you want. You can look at the nasal seal. Um, it's much easier to see it on tap, but you can also see it on radiographs and see the different the the, uh, the differences, uh, the different characteristics of each one of the uh, ethnic groups that you are looking at. Uh, again, you can make measurements in the to see, for instance, the intercondylar shelf to. Uh, see the difference if we were talking about an individual of uh, negroid ascent or caucasus or caucasoid. Very easy to do it also in radiographs, but also with the TAC. As we spoke about uh, with the age estimation of the living, the same thing can be done, of course, with cadavers. Uh, again, we take either radiographs or uh, nowadays we can do the CT examination and uh, the, from the exam we can make uh, orthopantogram of the individual and see the stage of uh, calcification of each one of the deciduous or the permanent teeth. Again, we can look at the epiphyseal, epiphyseal fusion of each one of the bones. You can see very easily uh, close up on the, on the whole skeleton. Uh, again, here you can see the dentition as well. But it's very easy, <clears throat> easy to visualize when you're looking at uh, with the CT. Again, if you're if you're talking about uh, adult individuals, uh, you simply make a cut of the uh, area of the pubis and then you turn it around and you can see the uh, synthesis pubis and uh, make your age uh, estimation very easily. Finally, when we're talking about uh, older individuals, uh, we can look at degenerative processes very easily with x-rays, with uh, also with um, CT, and uh, we can make uh, our age estimation based on uh, the characteristic cell uh, uh, processes that we, uh, we associate with older individuals. Uh, of course, we can uh, do measurements of stature the same way we do all kinds of measurements on the CT. We simply, uh, it's, it's very easy to locate the points in which we want to uh, do the measurement and the um, uh, CT will give you the, the longitude and then you put it in your tables and bobs your arm. If we move onwards and we go into necro identification, uh, we have to remember um, when we're doing uh, what we used to call radiographic identification, that although there are uh, enough differences between individuals that allow us to do an identification, when we're dealing with forensic anthropology, we don't have an established number of uh, characteristics that are required for an identification. So mainly our uh, identifications are based on our uh, previous knowledge, on our experience, <coughs> but we are trying to remedy this uh, uh, problem. We are uh, more and more uh, uh, investigations are going into trying to establish what is a minimum number of characteristics that will give us a positive identification and what will be not enough to do an identification. As I said, at least uh, not in Israel, there is, uh, at least in Israel, there is no um, minimum, minimal number required. What we're we going to look at, we're going to look at the different uh, uh, features if, of anatomical variability. I will talk about them, uh, I will go over them uh, as we speak. We will look at medical intervention and we will look at different types of uh, degenerative changes. I don't have examples of everything, but of course we'll look at osteophytes and uh, we will look at uh, um, the modeling of vertebral bodies, etc. So let's look at some examples. The most common method used for uh, radiographic identification, if we have it, and that's what we usually have, are the sinuses. The frontal sinuses are excellent for identification. Uh, there is a lot of research done of them. It is uh, uh, considered a very safe method of identification. Uh, I will not talk too much about this because Oscar will show us a, a few examples of the wonderful things that they are doing now 
with artificial intelligence, but I can tell you that most of the, identific the radiographic identifications, if we have the sinuses, is the best bet. Uh, also, we can look at the air cells in the mastoid area. Uh, what is important to remember is that sometimes we get very excited about an identification and say, oh yeah, look, this person has only one sinus, let's go for it, this is the identification. Some characteristic, uh, some of the variations that we are using are very common. So it, we have to remember when we're doing an identification, not only in, in uh, a radiographic identification, but uh, in general, if we're dealing with an open uh, uh, identification or a closed one. When we're talking about an open uh, uh, incident, we're talking about, let's say, a mass disaster, uh, we have a great number of cadavers, we have a great number of missing persons, and we're trying to match missing person to cadaver. So if, for instance, we, are, we were talking about this type of situation, uh, suicidal bombing, uh, uh, um, a big uh, fire, or something like that, we would look at, we would get an antemortem radiograph of an individual that has only one sinus. You can see here, this person has only this one sinus and the other side has no frontal sinus. And we're going to say, oh, wow, very easy. We find one of the postmortem and say, this is the person. But actually, 10% of the population have this condition. So it's not a very uh, good identification. When we're dealing with the features, we have to, uh, to take into consideration how common they are and how uh, non uh, or how uncommon they are. But if we're talking about a close identification, the most common cases that we have at the Institutes of Forensic Medicine, the uh, uh, lonely person that dies by herself in their house and the um, neighbor starts complaining about the smell and they open the house and we know this is only one person that lives in this house. Uh, the the person have not been seen uh, by the neighbors uh, a couple of days and uh, nobody else lives in the house so what we are doing really with the identification is um assessing if this is the person or not you know, we are rat ratifying the identification in this case probably we would say okay what are the chances that another person with one sinus has come into the house, killed the old lady, throw her somewhere else, and have come to die in her house. Eh, not so probable. Uh, other features that uh, are have been proposed for identification are, uh, for instance, the cranial sutures and vascular pattern, uh, vascular canals. I'm not very fond of this. Usually, I say, okay, if you have a, a radiograph of the cranium, if it includes the frontal sinuses forget the sutures, go for the sinuses. The sutures, uh, yes, they are they have a great variability, but uh, as we get older, they tend to disappear. So how now you have a little bit of inconsistencies and you have to fill in the gaps. Eh, I don't feel so comfortable doing that, but uh, it has been proposed by many authors that it's a good uh, method of identification. Another uh, method of identification excuse me, that have been used uh, um, very, with very good um, success, very successfully in the Institute of Forensic Medicine in Israel and all over the world. There is a great uh, uh, report performed by Professor Anne Ross in which uh, uh, she has examined how many features do we have to have in radiographs of the vertebral column to uh, specify if we have an identification of, or not. She has done a great job. She suggests something between five and seven consecutive vertebra. And she also, she suggests to use the uh, spinous processes of the thoracic vertebra. I have to say that I've had very good results also with the, lamb, the lumbar uh, vertebra, but nevertheless, uh, at least we have a specific number of characteristics that have to be seen on one radiograph or on one image to determine if we have an identification or not. And this is the, the goal of most uh, um, anthropologists today is to establish a specific guidelines for doing radiographic identification. Another example of uh, anatomical variability is the excitoid uh, process. As you can see, it's very variable. 
they have there are many shapes shapes that it can uh, uh, be seen and what is very surprising is this one that uh, i always thought is one of the least common the one that has the u shape is actually present in 27 percent of the uh, individuals so again when we're using a specific uh, feature we have to remember to look if we have uh, if it's very frequent or if it's for instance this shape it's, which is very uncommon and can be uh, used for identification the uh, other um, variations that we can find of course are uh, ossicles uh, in the foot and ossicles in the hand we have uh, they are um, they appear most individuals have either one extra ossicle or two extra ossicles uh, here you have an ostrigonum uh, uh, usually associated with um, uh, ballet dancing because uh, the ballerina goes on point and goes down and uh, stresses the uh, tendon until uh, it ossifies and breaks out. But uh, we ha I have found that the sesamoid and accessory ossicles appear uh, uh, also in individuals that uh, it's not associated necessarily with the uh, activity. And uh, again, if you look at the variability and you see, okay, this one is very common, let's not use it for identification this was is very uncommon okay it's a very good one for identification now we move on to degenerative processes and congenital malformations you can see here um, uh, one example this is an antemortem radiograph of the individual he has a, a degenerative process called a pincer, a pincer lesion uh, here uh, in this area of the acetabulum and we can see it in the CT some taken some 20 years later here it is the same uh, 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 lesion another example we can see some congenital malformations for instance if we turn around this uh, um, uh, uh, CT we will see in the antemortem uh, we have um, spina bifida uh, appears here on the antemortem, appears here on the postmortem, very easy to assess. Again, depending if we're talking about a close uh, event or an open event, in this case, when the individual was found uh, in his own home, easy identification and very quick. And then we have all kinds of medical interventions. These are excellent for identification. Even the common ones are useful for identification. Here you have a case of some uh, reduction of fractures with uh, a metal wires you have here one you can have you, you can see here two more this is another case when you have uh, a gain reduction with the uh, wiring of the teeth and here you have wiring of the mandible because this is done this is performed by the surgeon with his or her own hands the shape of the wiring and the shape of tying the wires themselves is going to be specific to each individual it will the a person can never do twice exactly the same tying of the um, of the wires and we can compare them very easily here is another example of a very useful medical uh, intervention when we have a, 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 a prosthesis here uh, depending on the type of city that uh, we are looking at, if the, car, if the um, distance between the cuts is very small, it's not small enough, sorry, we are not going to be able to read the number of the um, prosthesis, but just doing, performing a very small cut, we can uh, extract the prosthesis and read the number out and uh, find the surgeon that put this prosthesis on and find the person that uh, received them very easily. Here you have another example. You have a, 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 a city of a completely unknown individual. Uh, the, immediately the forensic pathologist noticed that there is a pacemaker there. Uh, here you see it much closely. Again, at the time our uh, city was not uh, um, couldn't give us enough detail, but uh, we took us, uh, we did a small incision, extracted the, the um, pacemaker, 
contacted the company and they gave us the name of the, pa of the patient that received this uh, number of um, this specific pacemaker. Very easy identification with uh, very uh, little effort. Even in uh, when we're looking at prosthet at uh, uh, prosthetic devices that are very common, like this uh, type of uh, device used for uh, fractures of the head of the femur, even if it's very common and even if we cannot read the number or the number was not written anywhere when the patient received the, the prosthetic device, you can see by the angle of the attachment to the femur, which will be specific to the shape of the, of the femur itself and to the fracture. And you can compare between the antemortem and the postmortem. You see one is going downward, the other two, which are further uh, apart, uh, are further away from the lowest one. They are uh, going upwards, uh, meeting a little bit uh, here at the end. And you can see exactly the same shape. And you say, okay, this is the same individual, no problem. And if we have, <clears throat> excuse me, um, here you have radiographs, antemortem of uh, prosthetic devices of the knee, and you can see by the um, uh, the antemortem is uh, you have here the radiograph, and on the postmortem you have the CT. The uh, um, it's very easy to take out the prosthesis and examine them, and uh, again by uh, using the number we can identify the person. The other uh, medical intervention, of course, that is very easy to assess is the dental data. I will not go into this. We had a specific uh, um, seminar on dental identification. But just to give you a small example, with one radiograph of four teeth, you can see so much detail. You have here four crowns. You would say, yeah, crowns are very common. But if we start looking in, in detail, you can see that this um root canal uh, was so badly done that it uh, went over the apex and there is a piece of uh, the um, tool that has gone into the the bone you can see this uh, root canal it's again also so badly done that it never reached the apex you can see here which one is it uh, this one, the crown is so badly performed that uh, it's what we call fondly a sombrero. The tooth will be lost eventually. So with just four crowns that are a very common treatment, we can have so much detailed information that it's very easy to do the identification. And then we have what we call souvenirs. This is the um, antemortem radiograph of uh, uh, individual uh, when he was attacked some 10 years before he died, he was attacked with a knife, uh, he was in a fight, and the edge of the knife broke in his skull, and the edge of the knife remained there forever. And as we were scanning, the body said, wow, look at this, what does he have here in the bone? And we asked uh, the family if he had some medical intervention, that uh, some fracture, I said, ah, no. He has a, uh, the edge of a knife stuck in his head with a souvenir like that. Of course, it's very easy to make the identification. And we have to be very careful with inconsistencies. We have to be able to understand them and to say this is really an inconsistency or something that can be easily explained. This is a case um, that we had the... Um, um, Look, it's 1999, a long time ago. Um, the, in the Institute of Forensic Medicine, this uh, a woman died uh, after she had been in hospital for a very long period of time. She was an old woman. And um, uh, she, the body was uh, uh, buried uh, with the family there. But for some reason, the family could not uh, accept that uh, uh, there, was, there wasn't a mistake, and this was not their mother. Their mother was uh, either uh, buried somewhere else, or she was still alive. There, there was a big problem with that, and it took many years until the um, court uh, issued an order to make an exhumation and bring the body to the Institute of Forensic Medicine to establish if it's the same person or not. 
So we did an, uh, uh, we took the radiograph from uh, when she was in the hospital. This is two days before she died. And uh, then um, we uh, uh, took radiographs when we brought, when the body was brought in again. And we looked at it and said, oh, look at this, all this degenerative process. It's so obvious that it's the same uh, woman. Look at it here, look at it here, look at it here. Same woman, no problem. And we were very surprised that when we came to give testimony in court, an expert for the family uh, said the, that, of course, this cannot be the same woman. He's a surgeon. And he said in the radiograph that was taken two days before she died, she has no tumor. And in the radiograph that uh, you are bringing here from the Institute of Forensic Medicine, medicine she has uh, this person has a huge tumor in uh, the pelvic inlet. Of course, this is not the same person. And we were very surprised by the um, uh, by this uh, information. We very quickly went after five minutes of research. We went through the autopsy. We came back and I said, oh, come on. This is a deposere. And the forensic pathologist, when he was doing the, the autopsy, uh, wrote down, there is a great deposition of adiposere in the pelvic inlet. So you have to be able to understand when you're looking at it, consistencies, what do they mean? Another inconsistency is the result of not positioning correctly the radiographs, the, the tube when you're taking the radiographs. When you are doing CT, of course, you can move until you get the same position. But if you see here in this dental x-ray, the antemortem, it appears to have two amalgams at the apex of the of this incisor. It's an apisectomy. And when we took the postmortem, there is only one. And because it was a ratification of uh, identity, I wasn't very worried, but it surprised me how much you can make uh, this kind of mistakes when taking the radiographs. Uh, I should have been aware that uh, looking at the uh, nasal aperture, you can see that the uh, here, the, the position is completely different from here. And it's, of course, uh, two pieces of amalgam and not only one. But they have converged by me taking the radiograph in the incorrect angle. The final issue that I wanted to talk to you about was uh, the cause of death. Uh, um, and you, just to give you a small example, I'm not a forensic pathologist, but uh, a colleague of mine, of course, gave me this, uh, radio, uh, these uh, images very easily with the CT. Many of the causes of death can be uh, determined just by looking at the, the images in the CT. That's why we call it virtopsy. You can see here the blockage of the airway with a piece of steak that the person didn't chew properly. Um, and the other type of injuries that we, of course, look in images, of course, are the non-accidental injuries. In children, what we used to do is what we would call the baby gram. It was a radiograph of the whole baby to examine for uh, older and more recent fra uh, fractures or, or typical fractures. This is a typical fracture of um, child abuse uh, by um, torsion of the bone. And here you can see in the CT how it's very easy to determine that, that there are a number of uh, rib fractures with different stages of uh, repair so we know that they happened at different times. So this child uh, received many injuries of over a long period of time. And this is all I have to tell you here. I will pass on the microphone to my friend Oscar. And of course, if you are guys, something wasn't clear enough, or if you have any questions, just put them in the chat and we will answer them as they come. Thanks, CP. And I, I just want to show you, uh, well, some research we have done during the last six, seven years. Uh, uh, well, for, for a long time, we were, I'm computer science, scientist, and, and my field is uh, artificial intelligence, but 15, 16 years ago, we started to collaborate with, uh, with forensic anthropologists in Granada, in the University of Granada, um, trying to automate and to, to 
to uh, make uh, tools for anthropologists, automating some identification techniques, and we started with Kerifesa superimposition, modeling the what is called in computer science the camera calibration problem. Um, well, so at some point we we discovered that well, similar technology could be applied to identification in, in the forensic radiology field. And we we traveled uh, to, to Tel Aviv and we spent some time with, with uh, Dr. Kahana. Um, we learned from her a lot of things and we, we keep learning for sure. Um, but well, the first thing we, we did, um, we have been working for some years, is uh, as you have seen, um, whenever you want to study or you want to compare radiographs or, radi or uh, radiographic images, it is really important the, the, that they are both, both images are uh, equally, have been equally acquired. No? So our hypothesis uh, is that we can try to make uh, artificial intelligence techniques to uh, to avoid this uh, this task uh, that has to be done manually by an expert and is tedious and is error prone because it's really subjective. So our proposal was to to apply over three D images. So in the end, in in the corpse in the cadaver, we can always make a CT scan, or if we have a skeletal remains, we can scan the bones. So our idea was to to use this advantage to uh, reproduce uh, the antemortem radiograph over the CT material. Um, well, at that time, the state of the art uh, has some uh, methods trying to automate part of this process or trying to at least give some uh, objective measure, some quantitative data uh, in order to compare the morphology of different bonds or different uh, regions uh, and well, basically uh, these methods or there are there were two two main methods. Uh, one is based on Fourier analysis of the contour of the bone in both images. So in the end, you can compare two numbers, so which is called Fourier descriptors, and and you can give a number of how similar these uh, shapes are. But well. I mean, taking this is already working with the available postmortem radiograph the 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 forensic expert has to to acquire, and there were uh, some works from uh, Dr. Carl Stefan uh, by that time working for the U.S. Army, as far as I know, who was trying to identify soldiers from Korean War uh, based on on X-rays from from the thorax. I think they have uh, addressed hundreds of uh, cases and they use uh, 3D scan models of the clavicles and try to compare them with antemortem radiographs that were taken to all soldiers at that time. And well, it seems they, they have some kind of success. But our proposal uh, goes beyond these methods. Well, this is already six years ago. Um, and our proposal is somehow we structure the problem in three different stages. First stage is the acquisition of images, in this case, the postmortem 3D image, and also the segmentation. What, what we mean with segmentation? Well, to isolate both in the radiograph and the CT scan or the scan, the region of interest, the bone of interest. A second stage is to reproduce the parameters of the antemortem radiograph, so the, the source to distance, uh, the angle, no, the, the the properties of the of the radiograph, and finally provide some uh, numeric quantified results to help the expert to take a final decision. And well, this is just we made some uh, guidance to to easily uh, segment the CT scan, which normally is is, is an easy task. Uh, more problems norm, uh, appear in the case of segmenting properly radiographs because radiographs are noisy, there are fuzzy regions, so we, we develop also two automatic algorithms. 
uh, to perform uh, automatic segmentation of uh, frontal sinus and clavicle and other, other regions. Uh, in fact, here you can see some of these results over a long data set of uh, radiographs. Um, in the two images below are the somehow the good results. Uh, green means uh, the expert made the same the algorithm uh, made did. Um, on the upper part, um, I show you the worst cases where the algorithm is not so accurate. So in the end, well, we can save a lot of time, but uh, an expert should uh, review what the artificial intelligence algorithm is doing. You know? And this is well result with the frontal sinus, which somehow is similar. And well, once we have uh, already uh, segment the bone, then uh, it's the problem of modeling the the X-ray uh, um, and try to reproduce the the antemortem radiograph over the three D data. Um, well, this is some examples again with uh, one we 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 have one CT scan where we can extract the frontal sinus three uh, D space and project all the different X-rays. And then we can measure how similar or how good is the superimposition and classify the, all the cases uh, in order that uh, saying which, more, which one is more probable to be the, the radiograph belonging to the, to the CT scan. No? In fact, we did that with 180 uh, CT scans and 180 radiographs of the same people. And we compare each single CT scan with uh, all the radiographs. So that makes a total of uh, 32,000 cross comparisons. And here you can see the results in terms of ranking. No? So for each, for each CT scan, we rank the 180 radiographs uh, with the score the algorithm give to us. No? So what are the results, what we can see here? Well, if we just look at the first position of the rank, uh, in 50% of the cases, this point, the first radiograph is the, the proper radiograph, is the radiograph belonging to the CT scan. But if we want to be sure, so 100% of the cases, we have to go here. That means we have to look at the 51st positions in the rank, which is quite a lot. But well, at least we can say, okay, we don't need to, for sure, to check all the radiographs. And well, it's important that here we are only considering uh, as a criterion for decision making the external morphology of the bone. But this is not the goal. Okay, this is helpful for the expert, especially because. Now we can better compare the two uh, uh, resulting images because they are uh, in same conditions. And at the same time, we filter a lot of cases. Uh, so if you, I don't know if I was too, too fast, but of course, feel free to ask me. I just wanna uh, explain in, in one minute what we are currently working on. We keep working on, on this uh, comparative radiography field to work also with, in cases where we only have 2D images uh, antemortem and postmortem, or the contrary, we have 3D images antemortem and 3D images uh, postmortem, as the picture I can I show you here, which is a work to do forensic identification based on uh, Palatina uh, rugae, uh, uh, and we are near to publish uh, this uh, work with really good results. Um, of course, next step will be to try to be more helpful and analyze more things or more features uh, like uh, trabecular pattern, anomalies, uh, pathological traumatic, traumatic conditions, because at the end, as Dr. Akahana explained, this is what the expert is looking for. This is what the expert really checks. Um, uh, automation also allow us to perform large-scale reliability studies, and, and we are we are doing that with different regions to 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 know which uh, 
which uh, bones or which uh, anatomical regions are more uh, useful for identification. And at the same time, we have been granted with a European project uh, for age estimation of minors, una combined and documented minors. Um, well, here we are now collecting thousands of images, radiographs, CT scans, CVCTs, and, and metadata. And our idea is to automate uh, different techniques no? based on, on different anatomical regions again. Uh, the hand, the, the teeth, clavicle, which are the, the three AFAT uh, recommend, uh, well, also the uh, pubis, humeral epiphysis, and knee joint, which has been pointed out by other uh, works as useful. And we are working in, in what is called black box and explainable methods. Black box methods are really accurate. Uh, it's deep learning, for example. I don't know if, if you are familiar with this work, uh, where you can give this model, mathematical model, one radiograph, and it gives you the exact age. Uh, but it doesn't make any explanation why, uh, reach in, why the model reached this, uh, this uh, result. And explainable methods are more close to the kind of reasoning the expert do, does. And well, here you can see just uh, some publications, uh, mainly in the field of uh, computer science, concerning the automation of uh, comparative radio radiography. Just, just in case you wanna, you wanna check them. Um, let me briefly um, show you. Uh, well, these algorithms already working. Now we have them already integrated in our skeleton AD tool. And for example, you have here the uh, two clavicles already segmented. Uh, and this is well to see the segmentation of, of these two clavicles. We have here, well, maybe, okay, the 3D model of these two clavicles. Uh, of course, acquired from a CT scan and segmented. And with these algorithms, we can, well, it was originally like that, and we can already or match it properly, superimpose them properly, and we can even check now the morphology, no, um, and, well, use different tools to check how good is this uh, fit, um and well this is really this could be really useful uh, for for having a proper angle um and a proper uh, acquisition parameter of or reproduction of the antemortem acquisition parameters uh of course we can i can show you just uh, other examples frontal sinuses uh, let me, but it's, it, it, it works the same, no? We have the 3D model, we have the picture. So this is the radiograph, this is the 3D model. Um, the frontal sinuses, and, and this is again the, the superimposition. And again, we can check here. Well, I, I, I'm showing you two positive cases, no? But, so of course they, they fit. But the good point is you can discard or help the anthropologists just based on the external morphology. And well, I think that's all from my side. Um, I just want to be brief. Um, but of course, feel free to ask uh, whatever you want. And, and thanks so much for being here today. <laughs>